So our first speaker today, we're going to be talking about climate change and gardening. Um, they're going to overlap some. It's an important enough issue that that's fine as far as I'm concerned. Juliana is going to talk with us predominantly about the science, but also about how it applies to gardening. And Tom is going to talk about the gardening, but also how the science impacts that. Juliana Barrett is with the University of Connecticut Sea Branch College Program and the Department of Extension. Her work focuses on climate adaptation and resilience, as well as coastal habitat management and restoration, working with Connecticut, municipalities, NGOs, and state and federal partners. She's developed numerous tools and websites for coastal residents on native planning and coastal habitat. She has a whole lot more here, and we're just not going to go through it all. She has a doctorate in plant ecology from Yukon and is co author of the Vegetation of Connecticut and recently celebrated her 10 year anniversary with Yukon. Julianne Barrett? So, Aspen Works, <laughs> I'm going to be talking with you about plant case, um, ground scale, and then try to bring it down so we can talk about some of the impacts here in New England and in Connecticut, and then how it relates to what you're most interested in. Um, so, my name is Connecticut. So, as I said, I'm going to start off with a little scale, try to bring that down to the regional, and then to Connecticut, what's happening here. Just by way of background, just a little bit, um, I'm sure you've all heard of greenhouse gases, and these are the gases that form a blanket around our atmosphere and help to, to keep heat within uh, the Earth's atmosphere. However, what's happening here are the major greenhouse gases are the dioxide, methane, ozone, water vapor, and nitrogen, and here's what's happening. So this is from 400,000 years ago to present day, okay? And over here, this is carbon dioxide and parts per million, parts per million. So this is one of those greenhouse gases. And as I said, we have time here. And what you can see is that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing. It's changed a lot over the centuries, but never before has it gone up in this way. Okay? And it has never reached the 300 parts per million before. So what's happening is with all this carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, it's increasing that blanket and keeping more heat trapped in our atmosphere. So, as that carbon dioxide concentration increases, here's the time, 1880. So, this is the Industrial Revolution. Okay. Again, to the present time, you can see the blue line is temperature, right? So, as the amount of carbon dioxide is increasing, our temperature has been increasing. And there's been a lot of fluctuation, right? 1910 in the United States, right? So you put this much warmer period, but the overall trend is up. Okay? So what is this doing? So what happens when you warm the air, you warm the water as well. So around the world, sea surface temperature has been increasing. So over since 1900, um, it's been, been increasing at a rate of 0.13 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, which starts to multiply that, gets to be a lot. What happens to water <coughs> when it warms up? It expands. Sea level rise, right? Just from the warming of the ocean temperature, we get sea level rise, and sea, sea level around the world has been increasing over time, ever since the, the glaciers retreated. Um, but in the last decade, that rate has been increasing. And then, of course, there's the shrinking um, sea ice. This is the Arctic sea ice boundary in 1979, of the red line. So you can see we call it a huge amount of ice. And then with all that carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, um, our ocean water can absorb a huge amount of carbon dioxide. But it's getting to the point where it's changing the chemistry of the water. So the pH pre-industrial revolution was about 
8.2. Currently, around the world, it's 8.1. And if you remember from high school chemistry, pH is a logarithmic scale. So that's a substantial change. And um, in Connecticut and Long Island Sound, we haven't heard monitoring pH for too long, maybe about a decade now. Um, so we don't have a really long time frame, a lot of data. <clears throat> but um, in the Gulf of Maine, they've been seeing a change in pH uh, in, their, in their waters there. And what it's impacted so far has been the larva of a lot of the shellfish. So those are the most susceptible at this point to changes in pH in our area. And a lot of the aquaculture industry is getting around this by actually um, in their, their tanks, in which they're growing the seeds in the water, but, um, by buffering that water. So here in the Northeast, average annual temperature is increased by 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Winter temperatures have increased even more. We have more frequent days with temperatures above 90 degrees. Maybe a longer growing season, and we actually have um, increased public participation. Now, just out of curiosity, does anyone aware that it's actually in action? I did. You know, we really started hearing more and more about um, the heat waves and how they're impacting us. But it's always the last Friday in May. Something we're going to hear more and more about. So, here in the Northeast, here are the projections. So, under the different uh, emission scenarios in terms of controlling the amount of carbon dioxide that is released, lower emissions, here we are in Connecticut, we get a sense of the number of days above 90 degrees. Under the higher emission scenario, you can see the Connecticut River Rapids, uh, <coughs> quite a few of them. Um, and there's our historical. So we've already had a heat wave in Connecticut in fishery. And we're not even at the end of May. So just to go back again, warmer air temperatures, warmer water temperatures, water expands. So what you're looking at is the New London high temperature. So this is measuring um, sea level rise essentially over time. Not huge, 2.55 millimeters per year about. Not a lot. Um, but you can see there's a general upward trend there. But this is work that was done by Dr. Scott Warren, uh, Professor Meredith from Genetics College. So he looked at two high cases. There's Bridgeport on the left over here and in London on the right. And so take a look at this. The trend, so this is from 1900. But if you look more recently, from 1981 to 2013, the rate is actually double that of the earlier rate. Okay? And the same thing over here for the market. So these rates of sea level rise are really increasingly substantial, which is, um, if any of you live near the coast, there's areas that flood now don't have a high tide, roads that are flooded, right? Um, then you can count that as a nor'easter or another storm event, and add sea level rise to storm surge, which can be pretty substantial. Change is in heavy precipitation events. Um, this is from the National Plan of Assessment in 2014. There's been a 71% increase in these heavy precipitation events. Um, and we've been hearing more and more about on the news. And so, just by way of example, so this is Long Island. So we have Long Island, Cliff Manhattan, over here as well. And this is in 2014. So over here, less than an inch of rain. Down here, we've got three inches of rain falling. And over here, I have Long Island, 13 plus inches of rain falling. Right within a 50 mile span. So the And here's what they look like. Now, this is from Australia, so you can see why they call it the great box phenomenon, right? We just these incredible deluges. Okay. Our stormwater systems are not built for this, right? Um, I was talking with a town planner in East Line, and he was 
saying that during one of these really heavy rain events, he could see the sewer lid, oh, sorry, he could see the sewer lid actually vibrating, right? Um, so along with this, then there's issues with our customers, this road, right? Um, road flooding and so on. So, come back to Long Island here. Um, the water, uh, water temperature in Long Island County has increased one degree centigrade, almost two degrees Fahrenheit since 1900. We're already seeing impacts to our local flora and fauna because of this. Sea level rise on the East Coast under the intermediate scenario will rise two to four feet by time That's a lot, right? When you think about some of these areas. And that um, NOAA keeps changing uh, the predictions um, and they are just going up. They're never coming down. Okay, maybe some of you um, saw this article. Um, I believe this was in the Bay by Susan Benson. And there's been a lot of work. Uh, DEEP has for decades uh, worked with researchers on a fish fall, monitoring the fish fall for Cotton Long Island Town. And they have um, documented a major change and shift in the species to warmer water species. Lobsters are virtually gone because they're in southern. Right, the southern extent of the range, um, very few lobsters left. Blue crabs are coming in, so it's not a bad thing. Billstone, <laughs> you remember this in 2012? Because of the really warm water temperature, Billstone had to shut down for a period of time. Will we get more storms like I raised? Uh, again, coming back to Noah, a 2013 study looking at their intermediate sea level rise scenario. Um, the researchers find that the thin level storm surge are likely to occur once a year, right? And this isn't just a coastal phenomenon issue here, right? That salt spray may have heavy winds, that salt spray goes miles over. And when the storms break up, move in Sorry, this is in Waterford. Um, this is a closed septic system. Um, the gravel is 36 months of this line has all been eroded and washed out. So this is actually behind the seawall. So seawall really give a very false sense of security and of being the over top and then scoured out. They give you lots of the tax base, right? Um, nobody wants to hear the word really not in our vocabulary that. Um, so homes are being elevated, and this is all along the East Coast, right? Everywhere you go, New Jersey, Delaware, <coughs> homes are being elevated. But the one thing to think about is that when you elevate a home, people during a storm event often say, my home elevated on space. But what's the first thing that floods? It's the road coming into their development that usually goes right through a tidal wetland or wetlands of some sort. So they're going to be cut off. Okay? And you know what risk does that pose then to emergency emergency workers, emergency managers, in terms of those people being stuck there? Increased heavy precipitation events, we see these pull out Connecticut, roads, bridges being washed out, uh, culverts being over top, this uh, was in eastern Connecticut. And then this is Irene. This is a photo from U.S. Yeah, remember when Irene decimated Vermont and huge massive erosion. So this is Long Island Town. Uh, this is Old Sabre here, Old Lime over here, and huge sediments that came down the Connecticut River after Irene. When we have those huge events, which are going to become more frequent. Um, then we have, remember the, the flooded agricultural fields, um, all the pumpkins, the pumpkins that were ruined in the harvest. Um, our stormwater, our, our wastewater treatment plants often can't handle this. Uh, this is an 
area of huge research right now in terms of how to make wastewater treatment plants more resilient um, so that they can withstand flood events. The flip side, what did we have last year that you know we hadn't seen in a very, very long time? So so this is as a stand, um, things are looking pretty good, right? We're just at normally dry in parts of Connecticut. Um, but as of this was February 7th, right, we still had um, green draft conditions in parts of the state. So definitely something to be thinking about. Have these extremes now, more and more extremes than ever before. And again, something that we really never had to deal too much with here in Connecticut is the concept of wildfires, but certainly if these droughts continue and increase in certain areas, this is something that we really need to think about. Um, just a few more things. So less winter precipitation falling as snow, more rain, the reduced snow pack, earlier breakup of ice. Um, I remember my father-in-law telling me stories of when he was young that they were driving model model skis across the um, Connecticut River when it was frozen during the winter. You know, that's something that we haven't seen. Um, earlier spring of snow melt, so then we get these earlier river flows, and it's all tied together, both in terms of the natural environment and farming, right? Agriculture, poor air quality, heat related illnesses, again, something to really think about, infected born diseases. We've all heard about the case. Um, you know, how is that mosquito <coughs> borne illnesses? You know, I think that's something that's still being examined and looked at. But certainly, again, something to be aware of. So, we're changing plant and animal ranges in certain areas. Um, the potential for disruption of food webs. Um, and we're changing extinction risk. So, here in Connecticut, um, we're at the, the northern limit for a lot of species, like the southern limit for a number of species. And so it's, it's interesting to start to think about what might be changing within our ecosystem with this warming of, of air temperatures, right? Soil warming, warming earlier. Um, so about two weeks earlier, spring is coming down. Um, changing migration, we've actually been studies that have shown um, on mountains in New England, uh, the north of us shifts in tree species and um, we shift in fish populations as rivers form. So we have those beautiful uh, northwestern Connecticut, those cold water streams, um, protecting those, buffering them, so that um, you know there's a riparian buffer along the edges that helps shade the water anywhere along those rivers. It is a critical aspect. <laughs> all right, this is the map maybe you all three, right? Um, USDA, so we have a longer growing these things that is now. Um, and, and when you start to think about this, how is it going to impact things like whale watching? Um, people come to New England to see the, the lead um, birders, um, and you're going to hear a lot more about this in the next. But that, that timing may shift. Um, this is uh, an assessment of the habitat of the highest risk for climate change here in Connecticut. And um, as you might imagine, uh, a lot of them are tied to wetlands, worse to swamp, but these are going to do offshore adapt mainly because of sea level rise. Um, And just to point out a few of these, so this is the Barn Island Marsh in Stoney, Connecticut. Um, there's already been, you can just go there, and if you've been there before, you're like, oh, this seems a lot wetter. Um, some of the niches are blacked up. A lot of the edges are dyed as, as the marshes are migrating landward. There's been a change. Um, some change in high marsh, low marsh. You know, and changes in some 
find a really important Connecticut River is sea level rise going to push the salt ledge further upriver? So, will there be a transition um, for some of those freshwater tidal marshes, some of the brackish, some of those beautiful wild rice in those marshes? I don't know. Um, and again, this is just only with some research going on at UCAN. Where are the pools? We have those throughout the state. Um, unfortunately, there is a program. Um, in which little pools are being mapped, uh, GPS, so that their locations and size and extent are known. Um, there's probably going to be some winners and losers in there. And then I mentioned having dedicated buffers to be really, really critical and important. Controlling and maintenance. So the, the healthier our ecosystems are going into them, right, the better we'll be able to. Um, so, after all this, what can you do? Well, certainly, staying in warm is key. Um, becoming a citizen climate scientist, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and consider taking political action. Um, and this is what I wanted to mention in terms of getting um, involved. This is the National Phenology Network. And
recognizable conditioning. Um, but they're saying that, that uh, in the worst case scenario, there are lots of different scenarios out there about what's going to happen in terms of change in the atmosphere and change in temperatures. In the worst case scenario, the winters could go up warm by 8 to 12 degrees Fahrenheit, and the summers by 6 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit by late December. So that's a huge change. Hartford could be averaging 30 days in the summer of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it's one of the things that um, Julian talked about is the heavier rain events, you know, these rain bombs. What, what that means is that even though precipitation isn't decreasing in the Northeast, it's actually probably going to increase a little bit, but it's coming in far fewer events. You have long periods between these rainstorms when you get no rain, or we used to have more smaller storms, sort of gentle rains. Which is ideal for the garden. To have a bomb that hits the ground and washes out across the surface and runs into streams and drain systems, and then just the water did mostly disappears, and then you get drying out of uh, the atmosphere and the, and the soil moisture in between, is a real crisis for garden, and it's going to become worse. Um, they're talking about one to three months. This. Uh, Study by the Union of Concerned Scientists is talking about one to three month droughts probably every summer uh, if, in, the, in the future, by the, by the middle of the century. Uh, the, summer, the summer weather, as Julian said, is, is going to last longer. It's going to last up to six weeks longer by the end of the century and two to four weeks longer by the mid century. Uh, and because, of the, because of the higher temperatures, not only are you going to have longer periods without rain, but the higher temperatures are going to evaporate the water off, off the surface more. So there's going to be low, lower soil temperature, uh, rather lower soil moisture like in the summer and fall. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the plant hardy uh, zone map, which of course we're all familiar with. But it, I think it illustrates some of the difficulties we're facing in addressing this issue, which is this is the old US, USDA map, the one that we grew up with for the last, um, and started in garden with for the last generation. In early 2000s, they decided, the USDA decided they were going to have to replace the map. And they went to, to reflect changes in climate. And they went to the American Horticultural Society and asked them to, to draw the map. Now, their old map, their 1990 map, was based on about 10 years, 10 to 12 years, I think, of weather records. And they asked the, US, the American Horticultural Society to replace it. This is a story I covered for, uh, this is one of my little bits of investment, one of my few uh, opportunities to do investigative journalism. It's very exciting. But anyway, they went to the American Horticultural Society and asked them to prepare a new map, which they did. And it came out during the, the Bush administration when officially there was no such thing as climate change. And it showed such dramatic change in the zone that the USDA was forced to abandon the map to throw it out. And they came up, came up with a new plan for that, where they were going to redraw the map, and this time they were going to use 30 years of climate records, which sounds like it's going to be much more accurate when you average it together and figure out, you know, what is the average winter low in various areas. But what it did was it, it combined our current higher temperatures with cooler old temperatures from 30 years ago, and it masked the effects of climate change. So I don't even use that map. Uh, what, what I use is this map, which is from the Arbor Day Foundation. You can find it online at arborday.org. And they, did, they created their map using 10 years of weather records, just like the old USDA map. And the interesting thing is that when you compare the, this, this map with this map, you get something like this showing all the zone changes that happen. So those pink, pink areas are areas where it used to be a whole zone called in 1990. And now it's a zone warmer. So you can see that how, how the winter, essentially, the warm weather is moving north through the winter. The red ones are, are, are two zone changes. It, there's a handful of places in the mountain west that are actually cooler. I'm not sure why, but that doesn't affect us in Connecticut. So we've got warmer winters. Well, what's the problem? 
Who's going to miss the ice and snow and the shoveling and the cold spell? Well, our plants. You know, the warm spells in January and February cause plants to, or likely to cause plants to emerge from dormancy prematurely, which makes them vulnerable to late frost. Uh, there were virtually no apples in southern and central New England last year. We lost our apple crop. And that was exactly what happened. Was the buds started to swell in, in February, and then there was an intense cold in, in March, and it froze the buds and killed the, killed the apple uh, blossoms, and we had no apple crop. Um, in fact, they're saying that by the end of the century, apples may not be a good crop to grow in Connecticut, um, it'll be so much warmer. Um, so it's, it seems contradictory that warming winters can increase the amount of frost damage. Uh, the early flowering can also cause a disconnect between flowers and pollen. Uh, this bears on that phenology cycle, which is the phenology is, you know, setting up a calendar of natural events, essentially. And the phenology of the flowers is different than the phenology of the insect. And what's happening is the flowers are blooming earlier because the plants are, reduced, are reacting to the warmer temperatures, but the insects aren't necessarily apparent. Appearing earlier. So you get this disconnect and you get poor pollination. Um, an even more serious problem for a whole group is, is, is songbirds, um, many of which feed their chicks on caterpillars. You know, caterpillars are, and are wonderful little uh, packets of nutrition. And they, they, so they, over the eons, the birds have adjusted their nesting time, their mating and nesting time, to match when certain caterpillars appear. And when you change that and have the caterpillars appearing early because the insects are adjusting to warmer, warmer winters and earlier springs, then the birds, the birds don't adjust, haven't adjusted as quickly. So what you get are the birds looking for caterpillars when the caterpillars are past, then the nestlings actually start. Um, so this has become a real problem. It's, it's, there was a classic study in the Netherlands on flycatchers but there's just recently been work done by the Audubon Society in the United States on the problem with our songbirds, too. So, earlier snow melt leads to drier soils in spring. Um, you know, the instructions on the seed packet plant as soon as the soil, soil could be washed because the soil in spring so often traditionally has been cold and wet. And so now it's warmer and drier and faster, and that's changing planting plants. It's changing uh, growth patterns in the spring. I don't know about you, but I've been having a terrific problem in the spring. I grow, I uh, had a garden up in the Berkshire for a long weekend. So I grow an awful lot of plants to seed them and then bring them up there and plant them out. I've been having a heck of a time finding, finding spring weather to plant them out into. You know, I was just, I went up there with a whole pile of seedlings to plant last week and it went up to 90 degrees. And it's all the weather. I just put the four seedlings out in the 90 degree heat and intense sunlight that just wither and die. So I had to stash them and wait until, wait until the hospital passed. Uh, warmer winters have also allowed growth to move in the southern caps and leaves. Do any of you recognize that dog? No, I didn't think you would, but you will. It's cousin. <laughs> the volume of eight south. <laughs> Well, Kudzu couldn't survive in the north. Now it can. And we have Kudzu in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, and it's like, like likely to become more of a problem as time goes by. Um, but the, the pests are one of the pests that um, the hemlock woolly and delphi. That's been, was held at bay for a long time by, cold, by winter cold. But as the winters have warmed, it's continued to move north. We've got a lot of uh, hemlocks in the, in the southern Berkshire side on the weekend. And so far, no woolly adelphi, but it's within a few miles. And these warm winters, I'm sure, are going to bring a lot more than we lose all our hemlocks. Just now, they're already gone now in this part of the year. So that's not such an issue. But there's some new, new pests. Um, this is a southern pine beetle, which attacks pines. I don't know. I see some nodding heads. Are you aware of the problem? Yeah, it's been found in Hampton. This is a shot of a, I think, a spruce tree that was found in Hampton in 2015. Um, they attack pines primarily, but also um, they can attack spruce and, uh, and hemlock. 
So the four hemlocks have another crack. Um, what happens is they, they, these, these insects will put, go into bark crevices and then tunnel around in the family for living tissue, making these, <coughs> these gluten, these sort of zigzagging tunnels, and they interrupt the flow of nutrients within the, within the tree. And typically, the tree dies once it's collected within two to four months. Now, it's ravaged the uh, pine barrens on Long Island, and it seems, seems poised to cause a lot of problems to pines in Connecticut, too. <coughs> Southern pine beetles. As I said, hotter summers are becoming the pattern. Um, the same with more rainfall typically, but in fewer, more violent storms. So that increases the stress on plants because you've got drier, drier soils, and plants need moisture to evaporate off the surface of their leaves to cool themselves during a really hot weather. So they're, so they're looking, uh, looking for moisture. Most precisely when there's least around, uh, or will and will be increasing. Uh, the higher temperatures increase the discomfort of gardeners, of course, and the health threats of gardeners. If nothing else, just just um, heat stroke. Um, you know, we can't work out there when it's 100 degrees. Um, but it increases the, the higher temperatures and the protracted periods of drought are going to increase the need for irrigation, which is going to put pressure on our air, on our water grid. Because landscape irrigation is a huge user of water, particularly if you water lawns, which I suspect very few people in this room do. <laughs> because you're a big garden. But it's, it's, a real, it's a real problem, and it's going to be a bigger problem in the future. Um, we're going to have to irrigate more efficiently. We're going to have to give up things like the oscillating scraper, which um, is very inefficient. On a sunny, breezy day, you'll lose up to half the water that comes out of the scraper before it even gets the grass and evaporates it. So you're going to have to switch to more efficient technologies like uh, drip irrigation with the soaker hose. Uh, yeah, there are going to be changes. There are going to be changes to the composition of what we call native flora. By the end of the century, in the worst case scenario, Boston is supposed to have a climate like the uh, climate today in South Carolina. Um, this could be a scene in Boston. <laughs> uh, we, you know, if, if we take action, it won't come to that. But this, this gives you an idea of how bad it can be. Uh, and it's changed, probably changed the northern hardwood forest. You know, currently we've got our, our native forest, mostly maple, beech, and yellow birch. Those are the sort of key species in the native forest. It looks like it's going to be switching over the course of the century um, slowly towards oak hickory, a more southern. Uh, the ecosystem of the forest. Now, what will happen to it? It'll knock out of all foliage for one thing, because the oaks may fairly drab color in the fall, not like the rain color in the maple. Um, it's predicting that the maple syrup uh, industry will move entirely out of Canada. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to bring substantial changes to weeds. Um, we heard a little bit about how weeds can actually benefit. From the changes in the climate, weeds are great opportunities. That's how they they you know, they seize on uh, any sort of resource that isn't locked up, and they, they adapt faster than, than our more desirable plants. Which is in fact dandelions. There was a study done on dandelions in the USDA in Beltsville, and they found that in the course of one growing season, dandelions could evolve genetically uh, when they were exposed to drought. But the, there was a fascinating study done by, I did an article for the New York Times uh, several years ago now on a guy at the USDA in Belsco named Lou Zisker who wanted to have an uh, experiment to see what would happen with weeds in what looked like a future climate. And what he did was he found a spot out in the country in Maryland, set a plot, outlined a plot, a staked out a plot, and planted weeds. Oh, the first person in history to look at that. like 30 different times a week. And then he took a plot in downtown Baltimore. And downtown Baltimore suffers from the heat island effect. You know, there's uh, lots of black tar roofs, lots of pavement, and very little greenery. So it's hotter than the surrounding countryside, particularly in summer, but also in the spring, fall, and winter. And it's also, because of all the auto emissions, it's higher in CO2. In fact, he found that the conditions in downtown Baltimore, 
were very similar to what's being predicted generally for, for Maryland by the middle of the, 20, of the 21st century. So he said that this was kind of like a look, look into the future. And he said that he staked out a plot there and planted the weeds, weeds there too. What he found was the phenomenal growth of the weeds in the city versus when compared to those in the countryside. This is uh, an Atlantis tree, of course. He found that the, in the period when he was growing, over the period he was growing the weeds, he found that his, his Atlantis in the countryside grew five feet to five feet high, and in the city it grew to 20 feet high. Now, he also found that individual plants, like ragweed, produced more pollen. Uh, so that's going to be bad for allergy sufferers. And he's, he's, another study found that um, poison ivy, when exposed to higher levels of CO2, produces more virulent uh, toxins. So that's, that's going to be a concern. Well, what can we do to combat all this? Let's not make it all the human uh, What can we do to break this addiction? You know, what is our 12 step program? Well, one is use less gas powered garden equipment. You know, it's typically powered by two stroke engines, which burn very dirty. Um, in fact, there's been a lot, a lot of exemptions for lawn mowers until recently, so they didn't have to clean up again. Um, there was a federal exemption on that. So they, they're allowed to pollute more. In fact, a lawn mower, a new riding mower, pollutes about the same as 11 automobiles being driven at the same, for the same period of time. So if we can cut back on our, on our lawn mower, minimize loss, and cut back on your lawn mower, that'll be a big impact. And then fertilize accurately. It really, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm always recommending to people that they test their soil. Have their soil tested at Utah, wonderful service, very inexpensive, and how many of us actually do it in our own garden? Oh, good. Well, you're much better than I am. I do it sometimes, but not as often as I should. You know, we shouldn't be adding fertilizer just because it's is you know we think it's good for the plants you know it isn't necessarily good for the plants one thing is there's a terrific environmental cost to most fertilizers particularly the synthetic ones the synthetic ones are produced with natural gas and they get for each ton of nitrates the sort of biggest the, the first number in the fertilizer in the fertilizer formula and often largest particularly in like say lawn fertilizer it's the first number is the nitrates not very high for each ton of nitrates that they produce in this industrial process, they release, uh, let's see, four to six, four to six tons of uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. So fertilizing your lawn is an expensive process, and it shouldn't be done unless it absolutely needs it. In fact, you can plant clover and, and have a multi lower that recycles the clipping, and you can just about eliminate it need for lawn fertilization by way. There's a, a quick a sort of fun fact, or maybe not so fun actually, is that the American homeowner uses as many as much nitrates on their lawn nationwide as all farmers in India use on all of their farm crops. Um, so we can have a huge impact just that just one by one just by switching de-emphasizing lawn fertilization. The other the other problem with uh, over fertilizing is that when you have those nitrates lying around in the soil unused, they tend to off-gas as nitrous oxide, which is one of the greenhouse gases. In fact, it's 300 times as potent as greenhouse gas as CO2. So you really don't want to release nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. Minimize your use of heat. That's really important. Heat lamps are great reservoirs of carbon taken from the atmosphere by plants and put into a stable form that then lies in the ground and isn't re-released. Um, there's peat lands cover just about 3% of the Earth's surface. It's not much, but they they sequester, they bang about a third of all the organic carbon in the soil on peat land. Now, to produce that, that bale of stag and peat, they strip mine the bog. They, they say that there, that there are enough bogs to come back that you know, the road exceeds the harvest, but they essentially kill the bog by strip mining it um, when they produce peat. So I don't use peat anymore, except I do cheat and use some for seed sire because it's antiseptic and I don't have to worry about the anti bog. Um, so I use a little bit this spring for seed starting, but otherwise I use compost. Well, 
plant trees. They aren't in you know, a pure all over there, or what's still there. But nonetheless, they do sequester. They bank a lot of carbon in the woods. And so if you plant trees and wooden shrubs, you can do something towards um, absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. <coughs> Compost, of course, is a, not only a great way to reduce the, the load on your town's waste disposal system, but it's a great way to produce your own organic De-emphasize Dickey and Tiller. Um, that's sort of traditionally, I, I, when I was learning to garden, you know, I was taught that it was sort of the standard part of the gardening year to turn over the soil in the spring and then again in the fall. You don't need to do that. You really can get by. I mean, increasingly fine energy can get by by adapting no till technique. Uh, farmers are doing it. What happens when you dig up the soil like that, you incorporate a lot of air and you expose the organic matter in the soil. To the air and it decomposes and releases CO2 into the atmosphere, releases the bank of carbon. So you get a, a momentary flush of nutrients in the soil, which is why it's back, back in the old days there would have been a lot of deep clouds. But it, it, it's bad for the atmosphere and bad for the soil in the long run. So the emphasize digging the soil. And then take advantage of what's happening. You know, all that runoff I was talking about in those big storm events. Trap as much as you can in rain gardens. The uh, offered extension has a wonderful brochure on how to create a rain garden. Uh, this is a school in Portland, Oregon, where they had just a black top uh, parking lot there, and the neighbors started complaining because the basement was flooding um, from the runoff. And the teachers didn't want to teach in the classrooms to face out onto the black top because it was so hot and uncomfortable and kind of dreary. But then they, they dug these pits around the edges, they took off some of the parking spaces and dug, dug shallow pits, lined them with very porous soil, and planted them on floodplain plants, plants that are adapted to periodic flooding. And they created this beautiful rain garden. There's a better view of it. Uh, that was a black box driveway. Now they don't, they no longer have complaints from the neighbors about their basement, but also it's become the pretty sought after classrooms for the ones looking out on the rain garden um, because it's, they're shaded and cool right before they were exposed to the sun and hot. Um, so that's, that's something you can do. Just trap as much of the rainfall as you can in the rain garden. And then finally, one thing that you've got to be prepared for, particularly if you live in a coastal area well, uh, of Connecticut, is that it's going to, it's, there's going to be a salty, saltier water. We heard about how the storms blow salt spray inland for miles. But one thing that's happening is that as the sea level rises, it's forcing soil, is, excuse me, it's forcing seawater down underneath the land into the aquifer. And so, whereas once this well was drawing water, just fresh water, pretty soon it's going to be drawing that salt water, sucking salt water, which means that you're going to be getting brackish water from the water system. It's not only like bad for you, it's bad for the plant. Um, but again, you can make this, there's ways to cope with it. There's the beautiful Rugosa rose, red bonnet, uh, you know, that, that will tolerate this trackish water. My power farm actually has a whole line of salt tolerant plants. Um, plant the lights have a whole line of salt tolerant plants. So that's something to think about. But mainly, the main thing I want to talk to you about is this and finish up with is that you, you really are important. You're, you can become community leaders. You can do these things in your garden, and individually it won't amount to a whole lot. But collectively, by, you know, by people like you all over the country, inspiring other people uh, to take climate change seriously and do what they can, you know, we can kick the, kick the, uh, the addiction to fossil fuels and maybe temper the effects of climate change. You know, one of the things about 12 step programs, they always emphasize that you, it's, um, you can't just blame what you're doing on other people's behavior. You have to take responsibility for your own acts because really, the only, ultimately, the only thing you can change is your own behavior. And that's what I think we all need to take, a, take home as a message today, is that we need to change our own behavior and get serious about this, um, particularly when there's gridlock in Washington. It doesn't look like anything very substantive is going to happen at the federal level. Uh, you 
you know, politically you can push Connecticut legislators and uh, the government perhaps to to address climate change. But nationally, it's going to be a grassroots effort. And that's that's where you can. Thank you very much. Well, not 
um, just out of grad school then and working on a project where I had to um, reevaluate um, a lot of the teams that were just DEP then, a lot of the natural areas that they had on their, their list. And I was out in the woods throughout the state all summer. And it was when I started out at the beginning of May, it was really disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a lot of work in the state last year. Getting coached here. <laughs> so, and here are a few, just a few photos from, by the way, I'm a book of those. I don't think it was a book of band, but I believe it is on the And then there's some of the, I'm a disappointed, there's some cute thing over there. The, the caterpillar is five or six pink stars, so the caterpillars are really tiny and then they get bigger and bigger. Male is five, female is six. Um, and up until the end of last year, I ran a farmer's market. This is my market bag. <laughs> and I ran it on the Higgin and Green and Haddon, and it was, they were everywhere. And you can see here on my market bag, there's a female moth laying in a bag, and they're on the other side of the strap. So the adult moths just exist to reproduce. And here was a tree on the green where they were really sick, laying their eggs. There were a lot of males hanging around too. Um, so you can see 2015, and I'm going to walk up here. People listening can just be recording, you won't be able to see me if I walk up here. But the light green, the light green here. The Juicy Moth in 2015, and this dark green there was Winter Moth, which Susan Munger talked about last year. And um, this is 2016, and all the red here was Juicy Moth, but not so much. I don't know, with Winter Moth wasn't on there. So Juicy Moth, maybe it wasn't as widespread in 2016, um, but there were a lot more. Okay, so these are the controls. You can scrape the egg masses and drown them in 50% oil, 50% water. Those are the oils and store the insecticide itself and then canola, mineral, soybean oil. Uh, you can have a burlap barrier. The um, caterpillars will get stuff in there, but you have to kill them afterwards, otherwise they just go do their thing again. Or you can have a sticky band, which you made in conjunction with a barrier. And again, you have to dispose of the caterpillars. We have some biological controls. Um, the biggest one is the um, fungus one. And the, uh, I, I don't want to try to pronounce it. E. Mamaya. And that requires a moist, a moist spring where the fungal spores will propagate. The fungal spores are really hardy. They will persist in the soil for 10 years, but unless it's moist, and what were the last two years? Drought years. So that had a lot to do with why the gypsy moth outbreak was so bad. Um, there's also a virus, the nucleopolysis virus, NPV, and it's characterized when you see the dead caterpillars and they're just sort of brown dead, that's from the fungus. But when they're more of a bee dead, that's from the virus. <laughs> <laughs> bee dead virus. And, and um, I, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station has a great, great fact sheet on this, and they have all the of pesticides, uh, biological and non, that can be used, but they don't mention the NPV virus, and the product is called Gypchat, so I don't know much about it, but it is available. Then there are parasitoid wasps. Over the years, 10 insect parasitoids from Europe and Asia were released many years ago, but the egg masses are so large, it can be up to a thousand eggs in there that the wasps can't parasitize all of them. And I did have one, if you um, see that pot over there, Claire Butler just looked at it, but all those pictures are high. She can tell by the little holes in it. Um, and then there's also um, BT variety K, which I'm listing under a biological control, but some people are a bit see the chemical control here. Um, but it must be ingested by the caterpillars, having an effect. It kills all caterpillars, not just 
me, what I think are the best practices. Um, I can I can share this slide. Um, and then any questions? I know we're all pretty pretty well well educated. Are these? Oh, did you <laughs> can you stick, are these slides going to be? Uh, I can make them available. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Here I am. I was the one. <laughs> 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 you see the question. The question was: Are the slides be available? And yes, I can make them available. <laughs> Better training 
to translate all of that great knowledge you're getting and be able to communicate that research-based knowledge to our clients. In short, it allows greater flexibility for both students and the program. The binder, the infamous three, four inch binder. We all remember that. Probably taking up space on bookshelves for all of you, or maybe a wedge up or something to keep the balance out. Now we're going to library, which is an online classroom program that UConn uses, so that all of this information in that infamous binder and then some will be online. And at this point, I'm turning it over to you to explain all of this good stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. I'm Jean Mendez and I'm out of college. And I'm going to say with the mic in a little different way so you can get a better recording on this. Um, so you heard Sarah talk about where we are as baby boomers. What we're really trying to do now is move towards not just for us, but the infant millennial. And they're the next upcoming generation. So if you could look 10 years down the road, right? Think about who millennials are. They will be buying houses. They will be doing their home gardening. They are the generation that has not been taught gardening from their grandparents. So it is our job to make sure that our program is getting contemporary. One of the ways we're looking at improving it is bringing it into Blackboard. That's a technical term. Blackboard is a course or a classroom management system that UConn uses for all of their online classes. So it's a tool that we have access to as a program within UConn. We started off the process a year ago where we actually started talking about, well, if we're going to do this, what does it look like? What does it mean? So we actually met with the Academic Technology Department at UConn and said it was time for the Master Gardening Program to start to move forward. They adhere to a program called Quality Matters. It is a standardization program in how to bring classwork online. So it's not just a concept of saying, oh, we recorded a video, let's put it up, we got it on the class. Oh, the hand up, put it up. No. We really want to keep the class the way it has been from an educational standpoint. However, there is a recognition, right? When you don't know something and you want to learn more, where do you go? YouTube? <laughs> right? Seriously, that's our starting point. It's why when Sarah talks about the stage on the stage, it's a very traditional method of teaching where we did a whole lot of research. And the only way you have access to that information would really be if you got a chance to meet that person or read their book or looked at their research. And now in today's day and age, we all go to the keyboard and we start to look it up. But how many find a video, find an article, read a book, and go, huh, I wonder what this is right. Is this all right? So what we really look for is a guide by our side. And the guy on our side is saying, hey, I found this website. So is that from Bonnie? Is that really what we want to be looking at? Well, come on. It's a commercial grower. We all know them. Well, we want to be looking at the educational information that's based in research. Well, I know it. Starting the National Garden Program a lot. We very much want to find the garden tips and techniques that are based in research. That is what we're about. That is what extension is about. It's connecting research to real life. So that's the foundation. This is the tool. And that's all it is. So let me show you a little bit what we're doing. Not only did we start with the academic technology department that gave us a good grounding on what we should be doing, there was a core group of the coordinators who got together and reviewed all of the objectives per module for the entire course. Once we knew what the objectives were going to be, we then started working with some of the educators within the math and learning program. And then we started building out the course. Once we did two modules, and 
we did that with and we did it with ITM. We then took those modules and had them beta tested this year with the Master Gardening intern. So let me show you what our interns got this year. As they came in, they all got net ID. That's the first thing we had to figure out. That's a technical kind of thing, right? It's a UConn ID so that they could sign on to the system. That part went pretty well. Everybody has net ID. They sign into Blackboard, and if you take a look, here we go. Okay, so you sign in, and you come into the Master Gardening program. And while the, the type might be a little bit small, it's a class material. And what they actually saw was this a little bit about technical tips and requirements, the tree, fruit, and berries module, and the idea module. You come in here, and simply click on that. And if you click on the module link, it will bring you into the actual online component of the course. In this case, it's given us a chance to look at our theory monitor and update it with contemporary information. Not just the photocopies of the page we had before. And we look to update that information, but realistically, now we really have to get a cool. So, in this case, what happened was <coughs> you can click on very few parts of the, of the content. And the first thing you came into was Mary Conklin's PowerPoint presentation. Remember Mary Conklin doing her PowerPoint presentation? Right? She actually recorded that because you would not have to have her in the room to see her PowerPoint and listen to her story. She gave that to the students. They were able to see that prior to coming to class. So, what do you hold the merit? Are you seeing a dummy? <laughs> okay, so the PowerPoint presentation, the lecture component, we didn't have to take up a whole class time to listen to Mary's conversation. Then, there was additional information. If you click on part two, it actually came right into tree groups or small groups or pets and IPM. And within each part, it had a, an additional supplemental information. And in this case, you said it was supplemental because there was so much information that we found that we now need to trim it down a little bit. But here's some of the things that we found. We gave each intern the newest, latest grower's guide on each one of the fruits. Comes from Cornell, printed in 2013. We gave them additional videos to look at. So we could actually see someone talking about a particular fruit, showing tips and techniques, giving their story. All from other extension services in the New England area. We also provided a way to check your knowledge. Hey, look, I read this stuff, I listened to this, I wonder if I got anything out of it. Oh, I didn't know that one. Let me go back. So you have an opportunity to come back and forth now, and while you're sitting there in your jumpy, <laughs> test your own knowledge and gather some of this information. The other thing that's kind of cool is all those manuals, if you want them, bring them. They're yours. They're all in reference guides. If you don't want them, download, download them to your PC and just have them online. And of course, you can download them to your phone and make them mobile. So the reality is, because we can now be the guide by their side, we're giving a lot of information that folks can look at at home in their own time. Because, you know, I know the PowerPoint has the extension folks sitting in front of us talking to us is awesome. But as students, as students, I can remain to a <laughs> The reality is, by 1.30 in the afternoon, it's like drinking from a fire hose. You heard so much. You're so being wet, right? But how much do you remember? Here, you have the opportunity to go back at your own time and go back and listen or check on it again. Then, here you go. Mary didn't come to class. What Mary actually did is get all the information to meet the objective. And then, as coordinators, we ran the class 9 to 12. 
from 9 to 12.30. And we actually came up with hands-on examples that the students had to do in class. And an example might be, I just moved to Greater Hartford area. I have two acres pieces of land, and there's an old, old orchard on it. Can I do it? Can I grow it? What can I do? Plastic walls with the trees? Or somebody in the room worked with his team to talk about some grape growing. And they actually came up with a whole company on grumpy grapes. Grumpy grapes. Grumpy grapes. <laughs> and they had this whole skit that they did. But what they did was they took about 45 minutes to work together as a team to come up with some really good information on how to go ahead and present that back to the client of the customer, right, to the homeowner. Then they got the opportunity to stand up in front of the room and do some public speaking. We had some really a lot of fun with it. We even had one group who wanted to go into a podcast something. So if we could do the podcast, some of these videos will now be our videos, not just other extension of the videos. So then, one last bonus, Mary Coughlin actually did a hands-on cooling session up at our farm in Bloomfield. And all interns were invited to come there on a given day. This year we only had the opportunity to get in time to go and get one session set up. But in future years we want to have two sessions, one east, one west, so that people who really want to come will have the option of a couple days and also some power time. So as you can see, the course is as robust as ever, even maybe more so. But the reality is it's not going to be from a fireplace to generate your nine hours. It's going to have information that you can actually touch, you can learn on your own schedule, and you can apply in your own. What do you think? So does the net ID, the you find net ID, last a lifetime? So here's the thing, okay? As an intern, everybody needs the net ID in order to sign on. However, we were all interns long ago. And right now, you don't have one, okay? But as an active master gardener, we're going to have to be collecting information to get you into the system as well. So as an intern, you're going to come in very much like when we all did the class that first year, you're really busy. But you actually kind of have a choice. So we very much want to go forward to act certified gardeners, but some folks, for lots of different reasons, don't have the opportunity to continue on. Of course, we'd like that to change, and we want more and more people to be act certified. If you stay act certified, we're going to re-up your ID, and you'll have access all the current information and like visual videos that we'll be providing to the intern. So it's going to be another incentive for us uh, to stay active. Because if you don't stay active, it will get dropped in the future. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? So the question was, what is the time frame for the, for the current active certified Gardeners who fit the net ID. This is something we're working on this year. So you'll start gaining information from us that says we're going to start needing some information for you. Uh, the process right now is the fact that we need obviously first name, last name, an email address, and then your social security and your birthday. So we have to go back. Oh. Right. But that is why we can't ask that now. That is correct. Okay, and it's not something we're going to ask out. Hey, but by the way, what is your social security number? I won't tell anybody else. It's going to be a process. It's going to, I mean, we're not even fully online yet. That was next year's class. So I probably will start seeing this come in place next year. Right. But the act of certified will start talking about what the process will look like. Um, and the whole social security number, just so you know, currently, hold on. As an intern, we all go through background checks now. And one of the background check pieces of information is applied in time is your social security. So we actually will use that as a 
time, or is that why when you're in here, you think that's the oh, very good. Okay, does that, does that answer the question? And that's your answer. Regarding the uh, social security number, my attorney has advised me to give it to nobody. Okay. Except my employer, my bank, and the IRS. Well, it, it, that's the whole thing. Is that as you take on the university network ID, we are seeing as volunteer employees. <laughs> so you know what? I think I'm going to take that as well, let's look into it further because there's some questions and concerns collectively as a group. I see another hand. Yeah, I have to ask you about the social security thing, like the gear. I mean, there's just so many issues out there, but you already know. Okay, for now. Two questions. Okay. Uh, in your example of the hands on the pruning session, would that be something that would be required, you know, for the attorney? So, so, the, question, that, so the question is when I describe the hands on session, will that be required for the intern in the future? I know this year we made it completely optional. Um, I don't know. Is that going to be something we have to That's something that we're going to have to weigh with accessibility. As long as we can make it accessible and have multiple times and places for people to do it, it probably will be some required. But if we can't provide that, there are limitations to what we require. Part of what we're doing here with Mary Conklin is, this is her busiest time of year. The fact that she even teaches for us is an extraordinary stretch. So that her doing two in session classes, if you will, is the way we can keep a really good expert teaching staff. Yeah. Yeah. This is all a learning process. This is all evolving. We don't have all the answers yet. So that, go ahead. Yes. Is CSB still part of the program? Yes, yeah, yeah. CSB is absolutely still part of the program. Yes. Yeah. That was your question? Okay, Josh. I was just going to say that some of the hands on training is what is going to be. Going on in the classroom, the the uh, pruning thing was an on-site demonstration. Right. We may be doing other hands-on in the classroom. So what John is saying is that the hands-on will be in the classroom, and the pruning was sort of extracurricular, if you will, at least at this point. Other questions, right here in the front, and then. So the question is, in the future, will we ever offer the class at a different time rather than just a full-time day schedule? Um, that conversation is the open, uh, that there has been some talk about wanting to do at least one of the classes in the evening. It is still in conversation at this point. But already at this point, we will only get half day in class, which frees up time for people. But yes, we're looking at evening potential, we're looking at weekend potential. All down the road, this is all possibility. It, and because it will be a shortened period that's supposed to be in class one, there is that it could be easier for folks to make it, but it also would allow us to offer it at different times. So it is uh, something in our conversation. We might not see it in 2018, but we might be able to see it in 2019. So for a potential uh, future MG candidate, does this affect the cost of the program? So the question was, does the cost of this program at this point get affected because of newer technology and newer format? At this time, I believe the answer is no. At this point, the answer is we haven't quite looked at all of that. Um, not having to print a manual is a substantial price reduction for us. Making the course a little bit more accessible is something we would like financially, is something we would like to do. Uh, right now, we're concentrating on making it happen. And that whole play with making it so. Okay, I think Karen's way in the back and then do one, two, three. So go ahead, Karen. What is the schedule for doing more modules? What is the schedule to actually bring this online? It will be fully online for the class of 2018. So in January, we will offer this as the model. We are currently set up with appointments throughout the summer to work with the educators to start curating information to actually start setting up these modules. Um, be on the lookout. You will get an app from our coordinators to say come on down and help work with some of these educators and help test us. All of the educators have said they think this is great. 
They've also said that either I don't have the time or I don't know how. So we're going to team each educator up with somebody to make this happen. Okay, I saw a bunch of hands. Let's go top row, left hand back. Yep. So the question is, can we or are we planning to do AMG classes online? And I'm going to say to the answer to that, probably yes, but not right now. Um, I have a quick suggestion. We have about five more slides to go through, which will probably address some of the questions, and then we can pick up with questions after that. Okay, so all the other hands hold on. We'll come right back in. Okay, we're going to, we've actually talked about some of this on my first row, but again, the in-class segment, the idea is much more hands-on. We may do the more in-depth discussion of a particular topic with the instructor. In most cases, the instructor will be in class. Mary is going to be the exception on that. So the instructor who does the material that's seen online will be in class to follow up with. We'll be doing small group projects and, and presentations, as Jean talked about. We'll be doing hands-on diagnostics and IT. So that hands-on stuff that normally you don't get for the office, we're going to start doing in the winter. And again, we've gone through this. We started with conversion. We went to curriculum review, evaluation criteria, digital content. Started to expand that bookshelf, if you will, that's on Blackboard with both required and supplemental material. We did two hybrid class sections this year. And based on the feedback from students, the instructors, and coordinators, we've been able to find two that. And we will be, as Jean mentioned, recruiting volunteers to help assist the instructors with converting this to this new format. So, moving forward, going public, we're going to be bringing more program resources to public venues. We're going to be creating a digital platform for public access so that as we talk about doing some of these podcasts, or some short videos you can go online, creating that digital library. Google has all the answers. NASA Gardeners have their white ones. <laughs> and master classes, we will start looking at making some of them online. Some of them as a basic, you just view it. Others as a more interactive platform. That is down the road. We're starting with the main program, and then we'll move on from there. So, down the road, certificate short courses. You may be able to start developing specialty courses. So, along with your MG and AMC certification, you might say get a water wise gardening certification, or something along those lines. And advanced specialty training module. So, that if there's a particular area you're interested in, the group of people are interested in, we can create content to develop that advanced training. And now we get to the question about. Master classes and where we're going. Along with all of this is that we don't have enough that we're playing with. We are taking the registration and class tracking program or the advanced program online. Starting this fall with a whole new volume, and once again, she's going to play. I am back. <laughs> okay, so Blackboard, course management system. Awesome, right? This is the stuff for mom. For all of us who are going forward to take continue taking those classes, the AMG classes. We know it now, right? We get the manual, see it online, we fill out the paper of that, write the check, send it to you time. And then okay, new technology. There's a platform out there, it's a product. It's called Go Sign Me Up. It's been in the work again for quite a while. It took about a year to get through the whole process of getting uh, approval on it. We have it. What we're doing is we're actually importing all the current information so you have classes in the past. It'll see your transcript from the new system. Okay, here's how the new system looks and how it works. Just know there's a software product in the background. That's the past. We call both times the other. That's not the cool stuff. This is the cool stuff. Okay, so you might remember. The picture of Disney. Okay, there is a plan in there. But there's this, this cover for this current springtime, winter springtime catalog. The information is then imported into the system and it shows up along here. Okay? So you can see the courses all lined up. Just click on 
the course. When you click on the course, it will bring you into a screen. Well, you can't read that because it's read out. What I can tell you it says is your description of the course right here. It tells you who the main contact is. So if you have follow-up questions, you can come right here. It tells you the number of credit hours. It gives you the direction, the actual address, and a map. <laughs> Over here, <laughs> dates and times, right? Start on 24 to 1 o'clock, go to 3. It tells you the number of hours, and it tells you what the registration deadline is. Also gives you a bio of the actual presenter. Right now, we don't have a cool little presenter like Dr. Kirsten Martin St. Joe's, but we will. So all of the information that is in the catalog is still there. Still there. Welcome back. Depends on a little bit more. Because over here, it'll tell you, come back. It'll tell you right here, open and waitlist. We're not saying we're going to do waitlisting quite yet the first go round. However, it will tell you right now how many seats are open in that class. So you know how sometimes with a lot of restriction items you have to call ahead of time? There's an open seat. You'll know that. Then click and you'll get add to cart. And there's your cart. Okay, again, you can't see it with this slide specifically. However, it'll say the course name, the date, the time, the status, and the price. You've all got online ordering. What's order number? It's the same thing. Same thing, right? If you want to add another course, click on it. Add it to your cart. Then process the payment. And it just simply comes up to the credit card online screen. Okay? That's it. Place your order and still pay by check with the plug in the box. There you go. Okay? So, questions on that one? Yes, 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 yes. It will be absolutely available this coming September when we start registering for the fall winter. Um, no. um, at this point, we, we are working out the payment. Um, and I believe it's going to be powered by what you can use, which is called authorize.net. So it doesn't necessarily allow a PayPal account at this point. It does allow for secure credit card processing. Um, I see it's $45 up to the That's just, that's just a sample. This is, this is, this is, we are not anticipating great changes. Again, slot is very great, but we're not we're not anticipating changes at all. Right, so just, just to repeat that question real quick, it simply will, what will the options be? It'll be more MasterCard, credit card, and not PayPal. And then the screen, the slide that you're looking at, it indicates the class is $45. The question was, does that mean we're going to have an increase in pricing for classes? We're not anticipating a price increase today. Okay, I saw that. Very good. Yeah, I'm just curious if any of the neighboring states are okay. So the question is, any neighboring state programs, have they gone online or have they done online registration? I'd be quite honest, UConn is behind the curve. So I just few of the programs are already online. We've actually looked at a number of the states, uh, and we've, we've uh, listened and learned. There is at least one state that is completely online, um, and they don't even have to do class sessions anymore, and they've gotten really negative feedback on that. Do you remember Oregon State? Oregon State. Massachusetts does not have a national program anymore. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Massachusetts is closed fundamentally. They don't have the university connected piece. And in New York, Cornell, I believe, has partially online. And the rest of the state, again, is not really an organized program. That's why Massachusetts and New York both come to us. Um, others have gone the other direction. Penn State just put out a hardbound copy of their manual. But most folks have gone online, and it's the way we reach one. Okay, I see one question here in my left, and one of them right. No, as a matter of it is now, the programs are available to you when you look at the general public. The general public has a different rate structure. So simply to repeat that question, the question is, are these available just to those going through the advanced program? No, they're available. Right. Okay, question is my right. My kid as a UConn student signed up for this. Can I access it through that, through him? So the question was, I have a student, I have a child who's attending UConn, or I might already have somebody else in my family who has an UConn ID. Can 
can I utilize their ID to sign up for this? So the answer to that is no. Here's the reason. Okay? This does not require a UConn ID. Go sign me up. Be open to everyone. And there will be a separate ID just on my personal account. So when you think about shopping at Amazon, you didn't need to have a special ID for that. You created an Amazon ID. And what's going to happen here is you will have a go sign me up ID. So it gets a little confusing, but we're going to do our very best to uh, take out as much confusion. You go back to Blackboard, no, no, if somebody's about to get that ID, is not going to take access to it because we have to provide the access to it through that now. Okay. Right. So if, if we're talking about the program itself, yes. Other questions on this? Yes. This program will allow you to cancel online. This program will also send out automatic confirmation and reminders. So you no longer will be waiting on people like us who don't always get that reminder out and type in the It does it automatically. Other questions? Can you there no, but I did have a class tomorrow at St. Joe's and Texas Bug well, that really true. Join us at one o'clock. I'll have to repeat again. We won't have this up and running for the fall catalog. So in August, you will be getting notifications that, hey, the new catalog found is online. Um, I'm probably actually going to do a paper catalog as well just because people are familiar with that. Um, but starting this fall, this is how we roll. Now, we're talking about this whole new wild, wonderful system of registration. I would like to give a special shout out at the moment to the one person who has made the ANC program work for the last, oh, I don't know how many years. Becky went around and had a faithful input. It's going to be well preserved vacation once this goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all, folks. Let's go.